have a glass of water, and it gives me the confidence to move forward and focus entirely on making the best show that I can. WP Engine knows having a checklist helps you focus. They've put together an extremely useful ebook, WP Engine's Ultimate Pre-Launch Checklist for WordPress Sites. It's full of checklists for launching your WordPress site with confidence. They've got checklists for design, SEO, legal, security, server migration, and a bunch more. If you work with WordPress sites at all, you got to download WP Engine's Ultimate Pre-Launch Checklist for WordPress Sites free at wpengine.com slash pre. That's wpengine.com slash P-R-E. So when you, I mean, you kind of went from making millions of dollars to losing it and then and then doing the, the same thing again. At what point during that period of time did you start talking about that? I think around 2010, yeah, t- just not that long, six years ago, 2010, I was just getting so sick of like going through this up and down roller coaster process. And I had no one to talk to about it. Like I was, I didn't really, I wasn't really talking to anybody about it who would understand. So I just decided to, I was going to write about it and talk about it with everyone. And at the time I had been writing already for about eight years to the financial world. I was more of like a financial writer initially. And before that I had worked at HBO, I was a different kind of writer. Um, but I was a financial writer from 2002 to let's say, I don't know, to even now to some extent, but really till 2010 or until 2009. And I just kept seeing all this BS being written by financial writers. Like they all pretended to know something. Nobody knew anything. That's why the financial crisis happened. There was like nobody around to tell us, Hey, don't do this. And I, I knew everybody. I mean, maybe there's like one or two random people who were making a lot of money, but 99.9% of people lost money, which is why it was a crisis. Uh, and I was just sick of the BS and I just, and I, and not only that, I was losing money. So I was like, here's what, it, here's how it really is. Was there a particular moment when that happened? Um, no, because even before then, I take it back. It wasn't just 2010. Even before then, I was writing a column for the print Financial Times, you know, the London based Financial Times. And I was pretty honest in that column, although, you know, most people don't. Nobody, nobody reads, nobody reads the newspaper, uh, the print newspaper. So nobody ever read that column, but I was already starting to be, you know, to state my opinions and state the reality, even in 2000, I started that column in 2004. So what, what do you think there was any period of time where maybe you were having, uh, thoughts about these things, about writing about these things, and then you held yourself back and didn't do that writing? No, I, I honestly don't think there was. Uh, I mean, if you had asked me in 2005, would I have written about a day or a year when I lost a million dollars? No, I wouldn't have even thought about it. It wasn't like I said to myself, boy, I really should write about this. And then I was too scared. I just wouldn't have thought to write about it because nobody was writing like that in the financial world. So it wasn't even like a consideration. But once I decided that, oh, my God, this whole entire world is filled with BS, I, I decided, OK, no problem. I'm just going to start writing about this stuff because this is the truth and people should know what the truth is. And if I look back at, at everything that you've done, you know, you went to school to be uh, a, a, for computer engineering. You ended up doing stuff in finance. You were a hedge fund manager. You started a VC. Now you're uh, an author. These are like really disparate interests. And I think that there's a lot of people out there who I get emails from people who are like, gosh, I have all these different interests and I don't know which one to pursue. And my, my answer to them is kind of like pursue all of them. But w- was there any time where you ever thought to yourself like, oh, gosh, I should really focus on this, this thing instead of that? Or, or was it difficult for you I, to follow disparate interests? Yeah, sometimes it's di- Sometimes it's difficult. Um, oh, hold on. The uh, sometimes it's difficult, but uh, I like Warren Buffett's advice on this. So Warren Buffett says, list your top twenty-five things that you want to do in life. So you want to be an author, you want to be a, you want to play the piano, you want to be a DJ, you want to be a billionaire, 
you want to be a day trader. You know, list the top 25 things you want to do in life. You want to be a parent. Um, and now you have this list of 25. Take the bottom 20 and put them to your right and take the top five and put them to your left. Never, ever again look at the bottom 20. And the reason is, it's a very subtle kind of reason. The reason is, is not because you don't really want to do these things. They're, they're in your top 25 things. Out of all the thousands of things you could want to do in the world, these are in your top 20 of your top 25. So, so his point is, every time you do any of those things, because you do really want to do them, they will distract you from the top five. So it's really important to do that five 25 rule. Mm -hmm. It's funny you mentioned uh, Warren Buffett. I used to jog by his house. I lived down the street for oh, yeah, no, no. years. Yeah, I, I, so I, he's got a small little house. Yeah, yeah. I used to walk right by there, you know, look through the hedges. And <laughs> but uh, and then I was, you know, the more I read about him, the more I realized, like, oh, he kind of seemed to have the same philosophy of choosing himself or. Um, he totally chose himself. Yeah, I mean, one example, just just like, OK, he could have worked in on Wall Street or something in New York. And he decided, oh, no, I, I'm, I'm just going to go live in Omaha where I'm from. He did yeah. work. He did work on Wall Street in New York, and he quit. And um, uh, you know, life became a lot better for him. He what are some other ways that you feel like he chose himself? I mean, I know that like he did his own taxes. He had his really small staff. Um. Well, I think if you look at how he started, he started one of the very first hedge funds, right? Like let's say in the mid fifties. And if you look at the way he chose himself there, he didn't just go work for, I don't know, his daddy's brokerage firm or any other company. He was like a little kid and he looked even younger than he was. And he worked literally out of his living room and would knock on the doors of his neighbor's houses and say, would you give me 10, 20, $50,000 to invest? And he started his first fund with $110,000 and he had a very unique fee structure, so nobody else in the world had a fee structure like that at that point. And he kind of defined his own rules every step of the way. Do you know there's a story about him? He wanted he always found very unusual stocks to buy. He wouldn't buy like, you know, in today's day and age, if he was starting out, he wouldn't buy Google or Amazon or any of these well known stocks that are in the paper. He would buy these little known stocks where you can't you could you couldn't even find the shares. So he would go drive up to the town where the company was. And he'd put up signs like in the local store, hey, if anyone owns shares of this local company, can you please call me and I'll buy them from you. And he'd just sit in the hotel, his little motel room, and wait for people to call him. So he he really kind of blazed his own path. I mean, I, we, we could go through every decade of his career and see how he chose himself. You know, another example is here's a guy who's worth $50 billion, and you would think he would have, you know, uh, he, you know, he... He kind of he kind of has forty thousand employees with Berkshire Hathaway, but really he just has I think about less than ten people in his office, and and the guy plays bridge online bridge all day with Bill Gates no less. <laughs> so he kind of is a great example of showing that it's important to have downtime and to be a little bit lazy, and that's how you you know people say oh no well, Warren Buffett reads a book a day, yeah he also plays bridge for eight hours a day so relax everybody he doesn't he's not like working that hard. And actually, uh, the irony of my own story is that my father worked for a Berkshire Hathaway company for 37 years in the exact same job. You know, got to like middle management or something. And, and what, what, uh, company, what division? Uh, and, and, uh, National Indemnity, the uh, insurance company. It's, it's like mass okay. transit insurance. Yeah. So National Indemnity, correct me if I'm wrong, but Warren Buffett bought that in like, I don't know, 1965 or 1966. It was one of his first purchases that he used, uh, that, he, that he bought with Berkshire Hathaway stock. So that was another clever thing he did. He bought this tiny little textile company in, I don't know, Maine or wherever, and uh, he used that stock to buy small banks and insurance companies. Nobody was thinking of stuff like that then. He was like the first mini conglomerate. Yeah, somewhat, there seems to be like this theme of kind of ignoring the defaults that are out there in front of you in life, you know, it, it wasn't just like going, looking at what was available to, to, uh, to trade and saying, oh, well, you know, this is what, this is what I have. He like was going out there and, and looking for opportunities. 
Yeah, I mean, he's con- that's that's what he does, and you know that's what a lot of successful people do. They don't, you know, as Robert Frost says, they 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 take the road less traveled or the the one less traveled. 